Hi, and welcome to video two of the EDU Electric CDU Conversion Project. My name is Eddie, and in this video, I'm going to be discussing the details of the design process for the CDU build. So first off, before we get started talking about the build, I need to uh, discuss a little bit of cleanup of the boat that I didn't get into last in last video before we could put it in the garage. Um, so actually, this cleanup involved a, a fair amount of new stuff. So I actually had to cut away the hitch on the uh, trailer and weld on a foldable hitch so that way the garage door could actually close because it turned out it was about actually about four feet too long but once I welded on this this uh, foldable hitch I was able to fold it away um, and we actually got it all jammed into the garage and with a, a couple feet to spare. Um, so of course after I, I welded that all I also needed to do some cleanup on the sea -Doo. Uh, the CDU boat. Um, this included removing a lot of the old engine parts, taking out any of the old junk, washing out the engine bay, uh, trying to get all that oil out of there because there was like a ton of two-stroke oil and it was just it was just gnarly. Um, so as part of this though, I actually was able to list a lot of the um, the parts that were still working off of the engine on eBay. Um, in, in addition to actually recycling the engine block itself. Uh, for money because that was obviously made out of aluminum. Um, so uh, in addition to that little bit of money from recycling the parts, I was actually able to turn a profit on the boat itself. Um, just like the previous owner had told me, I ended up selling the engine computer uh, just as an example for $700. But basically, yeah, I was able to sell the engine computer, the starter, uh, and a couple other parts from the boat. Um, and I still have a few listed, so we'll see if those ever sell from the exhaust system. Um, uh, but anyways, that's pretty awesome that the boat itself costed zero dollars so far. Um, however, I'm not factoring into any any of the costs of the actual electric system, but score. So at least for now, uh, it was, or at least at, at that point, it was free. So now for the interesting design questions. Um, so the first and primary question uh, of designing the boat was actually selecting the motor because that kind of uh, because selecting the motor determines a lot of things about the build, including your top speed, uh, your battery voltage targets, your your battery current targets, uh, the cooling system requirements, the mounting characteristics, and probably way more stuff that I missed here. So the original boat, the CD 2002 CDU Utopia, had a 240 horsepower Mercury two-stroke V6. It was jammed into the boat kind of sideways um, and wide open. It was rumored to do somewhere a little bit above 50 miles an hour. I've heard like 52 or 54 on some forums. Depends on whether you use the GPS or not. Uh, anyways, that's a pretty fast boat. Uh, but the 240 horsepower was a little bit out of my budget range as uh, that's about 180 kilowatts of power, which is an extremely expensive motor new. Um, Plus, while it would be fun to go that fast, 180 kilowatts is also a lot of power. So if we put it into perspective, let's say I had a 50 kilowatt hour battery. Um, that means that if I was going all out, I would run that battery out in 15 minutes or 16 minutes to be exact. Uh, no way. That's crazy. That's, that's so fast. So you get to the lake, you get 16 minutes and you're done. So I think a more modest top speed target was in order and a uh, top speed target that I'm looking at is around 40 miles per hour um, with a cruising speed of about 25, maybe to 28, um, seemed a lot more reasonable. Uh, so they actually made CD Utopia with smaller motors as well. I think uh, there was a 200 horsepower um, two stroke motor in there and they might have even made an even smaller one and I'm not, I'm not sure of the exact specification. So the boat can, can, can handle a smaller motor. It can still get up the plane and whatnot. So after all this, like deciding, I, I looked around, I looked at all the motors that were on the market. I looked at kind of buying some used one versus new. And I decided to go with a, uh, the NetGain Hyper 9 high voltage integrated system motor kit. So basically, um, and the reason I went with this NetGain Hyper 9 um, was mostly for price uh, because it's kind of an affordable motor. It's also new, so I, I know it's not trash and it comes with everything you need. Um, and second, it was how compact the motor itself was as well as the, um, the controller that goes to the motor. So the motor, I, I believe, is basically nine inches in diameter, hence Hyper 9 being the name. I think it's, um, uh, 
it's like 11 to 12 inches tall. So it's a pretty small motor. Um, and, it, and the whole kit was roughly $4,500 at the time, which included the motor itself, the controller to power it, the cooling plate to go on the back of the controller. Um, it also came with a, a throttle, which is off the Toyota Prius, and a display. Um, I think all that was somewhere about 4,600. I'll put the numbers in later. Um, and to me, that seemed like a pretty reasonable deal for most of the things I needed. Um, and so that's why I went with it. Um, now the Hyper 9 can operate, the Hyper 9 high voltage system can operate between 90 volts to 180 volts per the manufacturer's specification for the battery pack. Um, so that's a pretty wide range, which was great because um, it, it gave me some, some wiggle room to change stuff around. Um, however, kind of looking at wiring specs and the motor output charge, it was pretty clear to me that we needed to hug the higher end of that range, uh, closer to 180 volts, as close as I could go. Um, A, for the first reason that, you know, if you're running the same amount of current, or if, if you're running the same power at, um, at 90 volts versus 180 volts, so if you're running 50 kilowatts at 90 volts versus 50 kilowatts at 180 volts, you need about half the wiring. Um, in order to do it at the higher voltage. So A, it saves on wiring, but B, the, uh, the Hyper 9 puts out more output, or more kilowatts uh, when you're higher up. So at 144 volts, uh, you can get 88 kilowatts out of the motor or roughly 120 horsepower. Uh, I think it's 118, but, and, but if you bump that up to 156 volts, um, the manufacturer specs show that you're getting 128 horsepower or 95.5 kilowatts. So there is some benefit to also moving up um, in, in moving your voltage up in terms of uh, higher output from the motor itself. So I was pretty happy with that number. Um, so I obviously I'm targeting somewhere around 156 volt pack um, so that I can get that 95.5 kilowatt output or 130 horsepower. And I think that'll be more than enough to get the boat onto a plane um, and then cruise at a more reasonable speed. So uh, with the motor decided, it's now time to decide, it was now time to decide the batteries. Um, so I wanted about 50 kilowatt hours total battery in the boat in hopes that I could get about 1.5, one and a half hours of runtime at 25 miles an hour. Basically, I was hoping for a minimum range of 30 miles at cruising speed on the worst day, right? Uh, and maybe on the best day, we'll get a little bit better. So battery cost though was pretty extreme on a lot of places, um, especially if you're trying to get new batteries. Uh, even used batteries were kind of high in price. However, I was aware of a site called batteryhookup.com and I've been, um, been watching that site for a really long time. And one day uh, a great deal popped up. It was for 4.5 or uh, 4.75 kilowatt hour um, 8S Chevy Bolt battery packs that were rejected from the factory for various little things and dents um, and not for actual any um, for any actual uh, thing that would cause the batteries to fail. So uh, that deal popped up and I, I jumped on it. So due to some cost constraints at the time, I didn't have exactly all the cash to buy the entire battery bank in one shot. So I only bought eight packs um, for a total of 38 uh, kilowatt hours of battery to get started. Um, the plan was to run basically these packs in parallel um, in a 2P configuration of, of the packs themselves. So that way I would end up getting a, uh, a the top voltage of the battery pack would be 134.4 volts and the bottom end would be somewhere near 100 volts. Uh, but actually ended up being set at 108 and I'll discuss later why I ended up having to low, <laughs> to set the bar at 108. Uh, but anyways, the price was roughly $3,800 for uh, 38 kilowatts of batteries, and that was shipped. Um, so wow, that was a great deal. $100 a kilowatt hour is awesome. And especially for new batteries, that, that's just crazy. So these are obviously, these are lithium ion chemistry. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Um, they're NMC, which is nickel, manganese, cadmium. Um, so yeah, anyways, if that means something to you. Um, so since I only bought 80 of these packs and I'm only getting 38 kilowatts, uh, the plan was to later buy two more modules, bump the pack voltage up to the top. So that way the top end would be 168 volts 
and then the bottom would be 132. So that way I could stay better in that upper upper range of the voltage that motor can take. Um, so I would. So the idea was I would buy two more later. Uh, and thank thankfully I was very recently able to find those batteries again, and I ordered them. Um, they're obviously not built, and so when we first test the boat, it's only going to be 38 kilowatts. But uh, I do have the new batteries in, so once I get through the process of building that bank, I'll be able to add on in that initial pack, additional pack, and then the whole battery will be somewhere around 47.5 kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours. So, and that's basically the target. Now that we got the uh, battery packs and and motor purchased, um, I actually ended up purchasing the motor from a, a local company as a set. Um, it was called, it's called Green Motors Inc. in, in Phoenix, Arizona. So, um, and they, they were great. They had it in stock um, and the owner was super helpful um, in getting that to me really quick while everybody else was out of stock. Um, so that was awesome. Um, so, and I got the batteries from, from batteryhookup.com. So now with both of those things not not really in hand or in shipment or whatever it was now time to basically pick everything else that i needed to decide about this this vehicle right so that included picking a battery management system or bms um and this is a really important part of a li any any lithium ion battery bank is that you need to figure out um you need to get a good bms system battery management system so that you can make sure the cells stay within their voltage ranges and if anything's wrong, um, you can turn off the cells or you can turn off the battery bank. Um, and ideally in a, an electric vehicle or an electric boat, which is basically just a regular electric vehicle, you want this BMS to communicate via can with all the other stuff so it can talk to the motor. So the motor knows when the batteries are too hot or when they're out of range, maybe you can limit the power. You also want it to talk to the charger. You want it to talk to, um, I'm trying to think of what else, but there's a few other things you want to talk. Uh, you basically want all the systems to be talking on CAN. Um, so there's really was like two brands I was looking into. The first one was Orion. Um, and the second one was um, Thunderstruck Motors Dilithium Design BMS. Um, I ended up deciding on the Dilithium Design BMS because I liked the expandability of uh, your, basically you would buy one main unit that acted as the central brain. And then you kind of, you could buy these, what, what they called satellite units. So that way you could keep adding more cells or more battery banks or what have you. And they, and it was pretty cool that you could just basically add these on later. And I, I like that idea, especially since I'm planning to add one more or one more bank of batteries later. Um, I decided to go with this one mainly for the modularity, but I also like that, um, Thunderstruck Motors kind of has a whole line of products that all integrate nicely with this dilithium design BMS. And I, I also knew it works with the, uh, the Hyper 9 as well. So um, that was kind of important to me that everything would work together. So um, I got this BMS. I ended up getting the BMS with one satellite to start with. So that should be 48 cells theoretically. Um, and then I got 10 thermistors uh, to measure the temperature of the battery banks and various things. And then I ended up buying a fuel gauge uh, as, uh, along with that, I was, think it was $80. So that way I could replace my stock one and it will look kind of like, like a boat with a fuel gauge, um, even though it's battery. Um, so next, the next thing I need to decide was a charger. So I decided to get the Thunderstruck Motors TSM 2500 charger. I actually ended up getting the kit that contained um, a bunch of stuff in addition to the charger. So the TSM 2500 charger can do 1.5 kilowatt hour char or kilowatt charge speed at 110 volts, and it can do three kilowatts at 220. Um, but the cool thing about it is that you have the option to expand and add a second or even maybe a third module if you want to get faster charge speeds on 220 later on. So I figured it was it was it was fine to start out with one. And then later on, if, if I think that charge speed is too slow, I can just keep adding more on. And so I really like this modularity, especially in, in, in both the dilithium design BMS and the TSM uh, 2500 charger, because basically I, I bought the minimum I could get right now, but later on, if I need extra, it's really easy to add it. So that's awesome. So for me, charging in 12 hours seems fine, at least for now, uh, but maybe later on, I'm gonna hate that. So. I also got, uh, along with this, the kit with the J1772 port um, and the EVCC um, module that communicates with, um, 
level two EV chargers. So this whole kit allows me to basically plug in a standard level two plug, uh, cable into the boat and then it'll talk to that charger and then decide what voltage is coming in and figure it all out and then charge my battery bank. Um, and so I think that was about $400 extra on top of the charger, but I think that's super worth it just in case I'm on the road. I wanna be able to use like standard level two EV chargers. And in fact, at my house, I have a level two charger um, for, for a Tesla here. So it's like kind of a no brainer to try to use the same charging system on, on both vehicles, right? So, uh, so that, that was what I decided on the charger. So I like the modularity in the future. I could possibly expand that if I, if I'm really seeing that maybe I, I need something more like six kilowatts, um, so I can charge it in a couple hours instead of all night. So the next thing that I needed to decide was, um, so your accessories in one of these boats still run off of 12 volts. So I have, you know, I, I have a sound system in there. I have some lights and stuff. I'm gonna have like a 12 volt pump for a cooling system. Again, various things that are all gonna run on 12 volts. You could also choose 24, but it's just easier to choose 12 since the boat was already 12 and everything in there was already 12 volts. Um, and I'm planning to reuse some of it, which like, especially the lights on the boat. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, you really need a way, you, you basically need a 12 volt auxiliary battery, which I had one in my garage lying around. I had a nice Optima, uh, yellow top. So I'm using that, but in a whole day of running that boat around, you're probably going to kill the 12 volt battery way before you kill your main battery bank. So you need a, a DC DC converter to charge up that 12 volt battery. So. Um, to that end, I ended up going with the Thunderstruck Motors 144 um, volt nominal DC DC converter. Um, and so I think that operates, not, nominal means 144 is kind of the middle. I think it goes down to 108 and then it goes up to the top end of my, of my range. So that was perfect for me. It was also just a little over $100, so very affordable. And it can do 50 amp um, charging from the, from the main, 50 amps at 12 volts, I should say, because 50 amps at the main battery voltage is a lot, a lot more power, uh, but 50 amps, my load should be well under that um, at most times. Even if I have the stereo crank and everything running, I, I think we should be plenty fine with a 50 amp, um, 50 amp burst from that. So uh, now with the DC DC converter purchased or decided as well, um, there was just a few little things to decide, uh, and and that mainly was cooling. So uh, the the NetGain Hyper 9 already came, or I purchased it with a uh, water cooling block for the back of it. Um, so basically it's it's like a big piece of aluminum that sandwiches on the back and gives you like two, uh, I think they're one eighth inch NTP three, NTP, NPT threads on the front of it um, so that you can run some water cooling through there. Um, so knowing that my controller is water cooled um, and I've got some pretty big battery packs, I decided that I really want also to water cool the battery packs. Um, so I will discuss more about the design of exactly how I'm water cooling the battery packs later, because that's a, that's a whole nother can of worms. So I'm going to open that one up in, uh, in an actual battery pack video specifically for the battery packs. But for now, I'm just going to tell you that the, the battery bank is going to be water cooled with aluminum blocks and stuff. Um, and so uh, to, in order to get this water cool, I figured that we're going to be sitting on the lake. Um, and also, I currently live in Arizona, and it's about 120 degrees in the summer, um, the air is. Um, and so 120 degree air isn't really ideal to cool a battery bank, um, being that you probably want the bank itself to be cooler than 120. So um, it, it, doing air to water cooling would be kind of silly. Um, Despite the fact that the air is 120, though, you can almost, I, it's, it's pretty assured that the water, once you get a few feet into it, you know, it's probably going to be less than 80 or 90, right? So I figured it was a safe bet to do a water to water um, heat exchanger coming off of the, uh, off of the pump housing. So basically there's a, there's a big tube coming off the pump housing that used to go in the exhaust manifold. I'm just going to, uh, you know, take a hose, attach to that, put it through a nice uh, marine grade, like, uh, oil to water cooler, and then just run water, water to water instead of oil to water. Um, and so that's how I'm going to do the, the heat exchange. And so I think I picked that up for $50 on eBay. Um, if it ends up not being big enough, I can always order a second one and put it in line to get uh, 
basically to double the cooling right so um so yeah that's going to be water to water cooled so the battery that's how i'm cooling the battery banks and that's how i'm cooling the controller um however there the motor itself is air cooled which is one of the few limitations of this particular motor and i, I wish it wasn't air cooled um but it it's something that I'm going to have to deal with. So I figured there's actually another water line coming off of this motor or off of the, sorry, off of the stock motor. So basically the stock plate that goes under the motor um, will be like pressurized by the uh, pump housing of, of the of the jet pump. And so I have another smaller line coming off that. And I'm actually going to run that straight through a, um, just a small little radiator and blow a fan over that and then put like a shrouding on that to direct it around the motor so that way I can like cool that motor as best I can. As an added bonus that will also cool the engine compartment a little bit just in case I have some other stuff getting hot like the DC DC converter might getting more might be getting warm. And I'd rather cool, you know, with uh with like 90 degree water rather than uh possibly 120 degree air coming in from outside of the boat. So uh yeah, that's kind of my theory on the cooling system. So most of it's water to water, but a little bit. So the motor itself is going to be water to air. Um, so hopefully that will be will be plenty. Um, I, I think it probably will. But um, if it's not on, uh, maybe I'll end up wrapping it with copper tubing or something interesting. Um, so this also means I had to get a 12 volt pump that's going to pump the water around the system. And then I also needed a 12 volt fan. So I also picked that up too. Um, and yeah, and then finally, I think I talked about this a little bit with the motor. Uh, for the throttle, I actually have kind of like a throttle that's hanging out in the engine bay that came from the old motor that was meant to attach to that. And I'm basically just going to modify a Toyota, Toyota Prius pedal uh, to fit that. So basically, I'm going to drill through it. And it's, it's going to look a little funny that I'm using like a foot push pedal with a, uh, with, um, with a throttle. But I, I think it's going to work out fine. And I, I like the Toyota Prius. Um, pedal because it kind of like works out of the box with the uh, neck and hibernine. Um, in fact, it sold with the kit. So, um, and then finally, I think the one thing I haven't talked about is how I'm going to get the motor, um, the power from the motor into the actual um, jet pump. So the, the um, drive shaft is vertical in the engine bay. So basically I'm going to end up mounting the motor straight above it. And then I'm going to use uh, two drive shaft couplers. So one that fits like this, the C coupler on the motor itself, and then another one that fits the C2 uh, splines on the bottom, and then they'll basically be like a, a little rotating drive shaft thing in there. Um, so I ended up already buying those and got them all fitted, and so that that was awesome that I I figured out the exact size for the C2 one. So that should work out just fine, and that'll give us a little bit of flex just in case I don't line them up perfectly. Um, so then we don't. So I figured that's probably safer than a solid drive shaft. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for all the major design decisions. If I forgot anything, or if you're wondering about any more details of this design, please leave a question in the comments. I'm happy to answer it. I'll try to answer anything in the future. Um, so I think that's probably enough content for this one video, though. Uh, I've been talking for a long time. You're probably tired of listening to me. I have a few more videos in the pipeline. Firstly, the boat is up and running as of this week. Um, so I should have a video, hopefully in the next week or two of it testing. Um, so I'll probably get a first test and setup video for you. Um, so that's awesome. I'm sorry these videos are lagging a little bit behind how far the boat progress is made. Um, but I've been kind of working on the boat almost exclusively right now because I want it to be ready for summer, which it basically already is in Phoenix. So, um, anyways, I'm going to keep building that thing. Um, and I, hopefully I'll make these videos as fast as possible, uh, afterwards. Um, so I have two other videos in the pipeline as well that I've got the film for that I just need to actually do the voiceovers and edit all together. The first one is a video on how I designed and built the battery packs, because even though I bought those nice 4.75 kilowatt modules from battery hookup, that wasn't the end of the design process. I needed to put, encase them in something that was waterproof. And I ended up going the steel casing so that if they caught on fire it would all be contained anyways all those details are going to be in another video so be sure to keep a lookout for that um that'll probably take me a little while to make because i have to compile like a lot of time lapses for that um, but that should be a pretty interesting video um because that was like 
that honestly was about 80% of this boat build was building the batteries or the battery casings and the BMS and the wiring and all that stuff, right? Um, the second video I'm gonna, I'm also working on um, is a video on how I mounted the motor to the existing engine, how I did all that. Um, even a little, might even talk a little about cooling. So that'll kind of be everything besides the BMS video. Um, so I'm hoping that'll come out. And then finally, I want to do a video on the worst case range testing of the boat. And then, uh, you know, maybe actually seeing how much range I have when it, maybe getting this thing to surf and seeing how much range we have while wake surfing, wakeboarding, what have you, because that's one of the things I could not find anywhere was good data on how much we're actually going to get out of the kilowatt hours of this boat, right? Like <laughs> how many kilowatt hours equate to hours of fun, right? Uh, so anyways, I hope to do a video on, on that in the future to give you like a really good uh, depiction of exactly how well an electric boat works for a lot of these things. So hopefully all those videos that I just talked about will round out the entire design and give everybody some help in building a system like this if you're interested in that. Um, and uh, as always, if you have any questions, please just leave them in the comments. I'll answer them as soon as I can. Um, I'm happy to help if you have a project. This was really hard to do without much guidance. Um, so I'm happy to help you if you have a problem. Um, so please, if I didn't answer any questions, please ask them. Um, and I will hopefully get to them in a future video. Uh, until next time, we'll see you.